Hi everyone, um, and welcome to the Our Adoption series. Um, thanks everyone for attending today. Um, I'll get started. I think there might be a few more people trickling us in as I talk, um, but uh, we've got uh, a lot to cover today, so I don't want to waste <laughs> too much time. Um, so before getting into the topic of today, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the Our Adoption series itself. Um, so hopefully you've all seen the, the main website, by the way, which is where you would have uh, signed up, which is um, on uh, our consortium.org uh, forward slash webinars, if someone could add that into chat, um, where you can see the link to the latest webinar and also uh, recordings of the previous webinars as well. So there's already been two already. Um, that's our training strategies at Janssen um, and uh, scaling our at GSK. So the um, our adoption series is sponsored by the R Consortium. Um, so just a bit about the R Consortium. Their mission is to support the R community and our foundation to develop uh, infrastructure to ensure uh, long term stability of the R ecosystem. Um, they do that in two main ways, which is uh, financial support for infrastructure projects and um, working groups to enable industry collaboration. Um, this is one of them. Um, so the vision is uh, an R ecosystem advancing the 21st century computational statistics and data science. Um, so in terms of the R adoption series, um, the scope is kind of aimed at those leading the R adoption initiative. So it's a, a cross farm initiative looking at um, uh, individuals and groups across different um, pharma companies working on adopting R, but it's really open to all um, to present uh, to, to, and to view. Um, the focus is very much on how to, so we're trying to look into, you know, how we've done it, um, what we've done so far, so we get some real insight into what different companies are doing, um, and hopefully we can have a really productive conversation that allows us to get um, ideas from one another. Um, the typical format is a presentation plus a focused discussion, either a panel or a breakout. Um, the next talk will actually be pretty soon. Uh, these have normally been spaced uh, about two months apart, but we've squeezed another one in before the end of the year. Um, so that will be on the December the 10th. Um, and the title is uh, Speaking Different Languages, uh, Clinical Statistical Modeling in a World with Choice. Um, that's going to be uh, Michael Rimler and Mike Stackhouse, and they'll be talking about this um, group, CSR MLW, um, which is a collaborative working group between FUSE and the R Consortium, looking at uh, the statistical methods um, and how they vary between different languages. Um, there will be details of that on that website I just showed you on the R Consortium, um, which will be going up pretty soon. Um, I'm not quite sure the date, but uh, pretty soon after this, this webinar is finished. Um, so one note before I get into the talk and introduce ourselves. Um, so we are going to have a breakout today, but because of how Zoom works, um, right now we're in a webinar format um, where you've got Q&A button and chat and only panelists can talk, uh, which means breakouts don't work. <laughs> so um, at the end of this session where we're going to be presenting to you, we're going to switch to a different Zoom link and there we'll split into the breakout. So what you're going to need to do is follow this link. Don't do it right now, but if you want to copy uh, that link into a document just in case you lose it and you'll need that password as well. Uh, I'll be repeating all this at the end of the um, talk and we will share it in chat as well. But I just wanted to highlight this right at the start in case uh, you, you sort of days off um, <laughs> and you suddenly go, oh, where's everyone gone? So we will be switching to a different room at the end. OK, um, so getting into the topic for today, um, we're going to be talking today about our package management at Rush. Um, so um, just to introduce ourselves, so there's um, three of us talking today. Um, my name's uh, Kieran Martin. I've been at Rush for um, six years, working out of the Wellin office in the UK. Um, I'm now the R enablement lead and focused on the adoption of R within um, my department, which is uh, PD Data Sciences. Um, Tad, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, of course. My name is Tadeusz Landowski. I'm at Roche for 13 years, in industry 20 years, and my role is Pan Pharma Collaboration Product Lead, also the same department as Kiran. Adrian? Yeah, so my name is Adrian Rodel. I'm at Roche around five and a half years. Um, I've started with Tad the 
um, the NES project um, around three years ago. And currently I'm the chief engineer of the NES project. Terrific. Okay. So our high level agenda for today, um, we're gonna start off by um, giving you a view of how we manage packages that are on sort of a, a wider uh, level. So just um, in terms of um, what we used to do, what we're currently doing and what we want to be doing in the future. Um, and thinking about, as we discuss this, kind of what the needs of individual users are, um, particularly in a regulatory environment, when we think about uh, the complexities added by managing our packages in that context. Um, and through that, we're also going to discuss um, uh, internal packages and um, how we want, might want to manage those. Um, and that's going to lead us into a case study um, on which Adrian's already mess, me, uh, mentioned, uh, which is the uh, Nest uh, team, which is sort of a suite of packages that um, Tad and Adrian will talk more about. Um, and that will kind of lead into the uh, next steps in um, developing and enabling co-creation and collaboration, and just some thoughts and ideas on how you can build um, uh, these sort of software engineering teams around our packages. And as I say, so mentioned earlier, we're going to finish with some breakout sessions um, with three different groups on three topics, which are, I'll mention later. Um, so what I've put here is um, a very simplified view of our journey so far. And as you'll notice, I don't think I've done it too much in these slides, but I am a bit addicted to making puns on the letter R. I think it's one of the best things about the R language is it's very easy to make puns on. So you'll see it's R journey there. Um, and what I've got here is three rectangles, which kind of represent the past, present and future. Um, so while um, R has been around at Rush for, for quite a long while, um, it was often in, in a more ad hoc way. Um, like there would be, people would have a, a laptop version of R Studio where they do a bit of analysis on, or they'd install it on a server. Um, the first effort towards getting R adopted on a wide scale was um, probably in this, this rectangle on the left here, where we built a centralized R Studio server aimed at exploratory use. Um, and that was primarily aimed at uh, things like our shiny, um, biomarker explorations, any things kind of outside the GXP context. So people could use R to start doing analysis, but the intention was to kind of keep this out of the, the GXP world. Um, when it comes to our packages, one key part of this was that this was not just a centralized R Studio server that everyone, everyone went on to. It also had a shared collection of global packages. So whenever you went onto the server and logged on, you would have access to the same suite of packages that everyone else would do. Um, but because it was an exploratory environment, we also gave users a lot of flexibility to install any additional packages um, in their home areas as well. Um, so focusing on that for a second, um, that sort of um, leads me into talking about uh, reproducibility. Um, so this is the kind of environment that the exploratory world looks like, um, and also the validated one as well. We have a, a Unix server with R on top of it, which is reading um, data from some uh, storage portal and the code is then managed via GitHub. Then the outputs are then sent to either our Shiny or down to some regulatory reporting um, process, uh, which we're not gonna worry about too much today. Um, one advantage of having a uh, global package suite is it allows consistency across projects. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges with our package management, particularly when you have a user base who are used to using SAS, is that there can be so much variety and difference between uh, different instances of someone's use of R. Ultimately, if one person is using SAS and another is, it's likely that code I write in one place will probably work in another because um, there might be a difference in the version of SAS you're using, um, but it's less likely that you're calling on lots of different libraries. But um, anyone who's been using R for a while knows that um, anyone can install any number of libraries of any kind of different versions. And as soon as you start doing that, you end up with environments that are quite hard to replicate. Um, so our first step towards um, sort of getting around this was having this global suite of libraries, which were fixed and unchanged. And that makes projects much more reproducible um, because um, 
now it's much more likely that I'm going to come onto your project. Uh, if, if I grab your code, it's going to work for me because I'm using the same shared suite of um, R packages. Um, it also makes publishing to Shiny a lot easier because the Shiny server had connection to those global packages. So provided you were just using those, there was a good chance that your Shiny app, which you'd made locally, would also run on the server. Um, however, there, there are disadvantages to this approach of this kind of shared global packages. Um, one is that the central package repository needs to be really big. Um, <laughs> if you're particularly in an exploratory setting, if you're covering loads of different use cases, that ends up being a pretty large collection of packages, um, which is not insignificant and it does need maintenance as well. Um, also, if you want reproducibility, you've got to pin versions. So that, what I mean by that is uh, typically library pathing for a particular version of R, you can only really point at one global library. So if, if you want a new version of dplyr, um, you're not going to get it in that version of R. So the only way really to release new packages to users in this kind of model is you have to make an entire new version of R in which they can work um, because the, the old version um, is pointing at an older version of dplyr. Um, and the last one, um, which is um, maybe obvious, is that users are going to break reproducibility over time. Um, so one thing that's, uh, I think, definitely true with um, our packages, uh, particularly with a wide and diverse uh, user base, is that there's really varying knowledge levels of exactly how our libraries actually work um, and what the impacts of installing a library actually are. I think um, even for someone who's been using R for a while, they might not necessarily know what exactly happens when you install a new version of a library. They won't know um, that when you do install.packages, you're going to get the latest version of CRAM. And you're also going to get all the dependencies if you don't control for that as well, particularly if you're using a function like install.github, which goes ahead and installs the latest dependencies for you. Um, and then, you know, they're not even going to necessarily know that different R versions will be calling on different packages as well. Um, so this is, um, you, you can manage some of this with user education by letting them being more aware of this, um, but it can be a, a challenging problem. Um, so I guess our, our first step towards resolving this, um, which is kind of where we are presently, was when we moved to, um, uh, allowing GXP work being done in R. Um, so for this, we basically took um, that first step, the centralized R Studio server, and uh, created a validated version of it. So in many ways, the setup was quite similar uh, to that diagram I showed earlier, where we had a Unix server with R with a shared collection of packages. The main difference was these packages were validated for GXP use. Um, and one additional move we took here was that we made it uh, more difficult to install additional packages. So unlike in the exploratory world where you could basically install any additional packages you wanted and, and break reproducibility, we set it up so that if you wanted to add additional packages, you had to be aware of what you were doing um, and understand that those packages wouldn't be validated. Um, so that kind of leads into something I want to talk about, about um, education and um, enforcement. Um, so when it comes to following and setting up processes for any kind of large system, um, it, or when it comes to like package management, um, I think, um, and I've certainly been in organizations that have followed this, um, there's a tendency to build in too, much, too many controls on the user, make it very, very, very hard to deviate from the process or, or almost impossible. Um, and there's a couple of problems um, I see with that. Um, the first is that if you restrict people too much, you're almost always going to find exceptions to the rule. You can say, um, oh, everyone needs this fixed set of packages and they can never use anything else. And you will immediately get three people who have a really pressing need to deviate out of that. And if you set up your system in such a way that it's impossible for them to get out get to do that, um, you're making it much harder for everyone to do their work and you're making a system no one really wants to use. And that leads to another problem is that um, if you restrict too hard, um, users are just going to find ways around you. Um, the, the classic example is that if you make your RStudio server really horrible for everyone to use, 
they'll just download our studio and work there. <laughs> and then suddenly all of the effort you've done towards reproducibility and GXP is completely lost. Um, and I'd like to say that um, <laughs> this won't happen that much, but users absolutely will do this. So they'll find ways to get around what you do. Um, so our goal when, when building this was to build a process which could be followed and was fairly motivated. So we did make it so it was harder to install packages. Um, that is when you typed install.packages, it wouldn't work, but we built processes and guidance so that if you needed to do that, which users often needed to, they would be able to. So we didn't completely stop this, but we made it so that if they did it, they do it in a much more controlled and a much more reproducible way. Um, so I guess one thing to mention here is around uh, the process of validation of packages as well. Um, so one obvious thing is that validation has a cost. Um, it's uh, at the very least, it's a cost in terms of time to validate any particular R package. Um, and particularly depending on the process you followed, that could be quite um, an expensive cost. Um, and because of that, you can't include every single package. Um, it's just not really possible to do. Um, and users are always going to want more packages. Um, this is it, it. This again is another one that's that's a bit tricky to balance because um, there, there's definitely uh, I've definitely from experience had people asking for R packages they didn't really need. They could utterly replicate the functionality in a different R package, but there's always going to be cases where there's some statistical method that only exists in a particular R package. And when that's the case, there's really nothing the user can do other than use that R package or <laughs> wholeheartedly just grab the code for, from the source code as well. Um, the other thing I want to mention around um, validation as well is you kind of have to be careful when you talk about validating R packages. Um, because you really need to validate packages in the context they exist in. That is, a package has lots of dependencies and reverse dependencies. It, it depends on a bunch of R packages. It depends on the version of R you're using. It depends on the operating system and the underlying uh, installations of C, for instance, that are running on that system. So you really can only validate packages in a context. And it's important for users to understand that, that validating a package just completely on its own probably isn't going to be sufficient for um, most purposes. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is just um, internal packages. Um, so packages get developed for lots of different purposes internally. Um, and while I think um, I and um, Russian General are moving more towards um, open sourcing more of our packages, um, I think there's always going to be a place for a package that is purely internal to the business, simply because there are packages where it doesn't really make much sense to, to open source it. Um, so one example is um, API access. Um, we have lots of internal APIs for things like GitHub or um, our, our databases or um, metadata, all sorts of things where um, that's an internal system that no one else in the world wants to access other than people at Rush. Um, but it can be very useful to develop an R package to make that access easier. And we certainly have lots of examples of that. Um, and interestingly, those packages, um, if we want to use them in a GXP context, can be a little hard to validate from uh, an external user because the external user doesn't have access to our APIs, so they can't really test our package very thoroughly. Um, and there's obviously other internal uses. I mean, one obvious one is tools for internal clinical trials and kind of the NEST team is going to actually cover both this and statistical methods to some extent, um, tools specific to the kind of reporting work we're doing as well. So one challenge we're going to face, um, and this is actually true of external packages as well, but definitely internal packages, is that developers have a variety of backgrounds. Um, they may not be familiar with um, many software engineering principles or any software engineering principles at all when they develop their R packages. If we're lucky, they may have read um, something like Hadley Wickham's book on R packages, so they have some kind of basis for what might be good principles. Um, but even then, that's not guaranteed. There is definitely, I, I know of statisticians who develop R packages who uh, have been coding in R well before um, 
those kind of resources before Roxygen existed. Um, so they haven't necessarily followed the best practices when building those packages. Um, so one thing we have to think about is um, how do we encourage these kind of best practices and how do we get people um, up to speed into what we think um, our packages should ideally look like. Um, so I guess there's sort of three levels of quality control, and there's probably more than this, um, but uh, this kind of leads us into the, the future state as well. Um, the minimal one we could do, um, and this could this can be useful in a context where you maybe don't need um, full GXP validation, you just want a basic check of quality, is just that it passes CRAN checks. Um, that's a really useful thing to get people to do in general. Um, CRAN checks are not that stringent, but they do check for some basic code hygiene in your package, and they can cap some bad practices at least. Um, if you have any tests, the CRAN checks will check if those tests actually run successfully. Um, the heavyweight approach, and that's kind of what we took when we built this validated server, is we can externally validate. We can pay external companies to help us validate these R packages. Um, however, there is a new approach that we are hoping to move to really soon, which is basically building automated checking of quality measures. So we want to do something a bit more robust than just doing CRAN checks, but we also don't want to go full heavyweight of adding our own additional tests. So instead, what we want to build, uh, in fact, what we have built is a, a series of um, uh, automated tests that look at the co code quality. Um, and if, if you're interested in this, there was actually a talk um, in our Pharma by uh, Colleen Zavallis all about um, auto-validate R um, and all the tooling we're building to be able to um, basically move our validation into an internal setting. Um, so that takes me to my last slide before, well, my penultimate slide before we move on to um, the uh, Nest project in detail, is just thinking about the future as well. Um, so when it comes to um, our packages in particular, um, but also the uh, environment, we want to move away from this centralized server, which is sort of quite restrained in how it works and it kind of has to be one size fits all, and move to a situation where we take advantage of um, Dockerized technologies to build images of validation and exploratory. Um, and that gives us a lot more flexibility ability to move quickly um, and to switch from one environment to another more flexibly. Um, the idea is that images will then contain perhaps a small selection of packages, and then we'll have an internal package repository for installation and make use of tools like our RM to manage packages. Um, and that way we we get this full suite of reproducibility because we have the, the operating system controlled by the image and then the packages controlled with package manager plus RM. Um, and that will allow us to be pretty reproducible while also giving the users a lot of flexibility for how they use these systems. Um, so um, just a word on package manager. This is something we're moving to rather than something we're, we're actively using. Um, so rather than having this sort of shared uh, already installed packages. Instead, we have a global repository with managed snapshots of our packages, um, giving users flexibility to determine which snapshots they're going to make use of, um, which allows more flexibility and protects reproducibility. And it's really easy to integrate internal packages to this. We can just um, add them as images to the um, package manager. Um, the tool we are choosing to, uh, we're thinking of using is RStudio Package Manager, um, which um, we, we um, think will be <laughs> quite a flexible and useful tool. Um, this is really a view of the future though, so I, I'm not going to go into too much detail here today. Um, so yeah, I will now pass over to Tad to talk Thank about you, Kieran. Thank you, Kieran. And um, yeah, the, the next one we, uh, we want to actually, as a part of this, uh, how we manage our packages, really focus on one of our uh, project internal project code uh, called NAS and and wanted here to really thank all of the uh, people that that were with our journey and this project grew really to, uh, to quite a substantial team right now and uh, and this is really fantastic and we hope we'll show you first a little bit history and what was about and next slide please so first of all um, I wanted to talk about a little bit that uh, the NEST project from the beginning on uh, had in our mind that we wanted to really, everything we were doing in this project, we wanted to challenge the status quo 
in study report, uh, study results delivery internally, but also externally. This is really important aspect and, and I will hope we'll touch this also today. And we, we believe about this really differently because we, the way we challenging the status quo is by, really by careful design of the, the, the steel shiny uh, framework, uh, which, is, uh, which is easy to use and user friendly. And what is quite uh, unique, it, it uh, connects the exploratory uh, analysis uh, capability where this is where we start and also regulatory. And uh, this, this, is, this is what we will show you today. And um, the most important that from the beginning on, we were aiming to automate, we, we were applying the CICD, also agile uh, uh, methodology. And at the end, we have uh, the, the, the various teams and, and the products and all together, it, uh, it consists like a 22 hour packages with extensive documentation automation logic. So a little bit of details, next slide, please. So a little bit history, uh, which I, I, I would tell you here. Uh, in fact, the, the project, when it was founded, it was around three years, but as a proof of concept using Shiny in an in a exploration of, of study results started around 2016 already, maybe a little bit earlier. Whereas the, the TIL analysis, uh, it started with the project at the beginning of 2017, where we uh, were thinking uh, about how we can help our scientists to better understand the data. And this is how the first uh, TIL app started for our translation medicine scientists. And we then follow up with, with the next use case where we uh, build a custom uh, customized app for the RNA-seq analysis. I think if I remember correctly, 800. So it showed really that we can speed up with that. Um, can you click please? And this is this actually show this uh, that we from the beginning we were thinking and challenges status quo. This from the left side, from the spiral of the different analysis to the one suite of the of the interactivity where user can really nicely navigate from the filtering, from the encodings, and having the everything under control together with the R show uh, show art uh, show R code generation. Can you click please? And then over the time, uh, we built a lot of, so I think end of the 2017, we started the proof of concept on our, uh, of our studies on the database logs, where we proved that we can really um, uh, augment our normal uh, static uh, analysis with this interactive. And this really uh, proved the, the concept. And from the beginning of 2019, we started the, 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 with the small scale the project. Can you click this? And this represents that the different visualization over the time we're adding more and more. So starting from the Kaplan-Meier, there were more on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the study results implementation up to the more generic uh, uh, application. Can you click this? Yes, and then we, over the time, uh, uh, once developing all of those shiny application, we also <coughs> pay attention into the into documentation. Can you click please? And this represents, this is actually the, the, our latest uh, snapshot of course of this documentation, but uh, which each release had always the extensive documentation, not only the R packages, but also end user facing uh, with the TIL module, with the examples, uh, our TLG catalog, uh, biomarker catalog, many, many more, more examples where people were able to really take it and implement into the study. Can you click this? And then you can see into, from the 2019, we really started our journey as a project. We implemented the Scrum methodology and you can see here uh, the different sprints. And, um, and I have to say that one of the, one of the uh, teams, the core team, uh, we'll have a uh, sprint number 50 uh, end of this year. And uh, this shows, you know, the whole long, long history. 
uh, of this. And uh, we always use, as you can see here, we had a sprint planning, we have a daily scrum of scrum, we use DevOps, we use automation and, and everything. And now uh, you can see that first release was really in April, 2019, followed by the other releases. And from 2020, we had releases every two months uh, right now. And now we are going to the stage where we're thinking and preparing, uh, in fact, this, um, this project that we could maybe collaborate on that because we believe there is lots of good value in this that could change the industry. Next slide, please. Okay, Adrian, back to you. Good, thank you, Todd. So I'm going to talk about a couple of our products and then about more about the organization um, and the documentation of our products. So if you go to the next slide, please, Kieran. So four of the main products and there, as Todd mentioned, there are around 22 packages. Those are just a, um, some of the core packages for end users or our tables to create is a generic um, framework to create tables in R um, and turn which then extends our tables to create um, tables used for clinical trial analysis. It also does graphs and in the future listings. Um, and Chevron then is a templating package where um, you can very, very quickly create a table given data that follow a standard. Um, and TEAL is what Todd mentioned, the shiny based interactive. Um, dashboard toolkit. Um, and in the bottom you see, and I'm going to show that later live, um, that the code that we add from our tables to turn to Chevron, or that what changes is that, yeah, our table is very general. It's essentially so you can split um, by variables, you can analyze, um, you, you can summarize row groups and so on. Um, and then turn adds different layout and instructions that do statistical methods and um, yeah, essentially are geared towards clinical trial analysis. And then Chevron, we link them deeply in the standards and there we get data stand, like data stand, like, sorry, data format um, dependent, meaning now we assume ADSL follows CDISC standards and there's only very, very few arguments in the Chevron um, template functions to create a table. Good, if you could continue, Kieran. And so the, the products themselves, um, so the reason we, we create them, which will be part of the discussion in the breakout rooms, um, is because there are certain use cases that are important um, for the pharmaceutical industry for clinical trial reporting. And so for example, here is how, how we designed um, our tables to essentially distinguish between the rows. And so you see here label rows, um, like how we separate the, the rows of an R table into label content and analysis rows, which is important that when you start pagination, so you split the table up and print it on multiple letter pages on multiple pages, we want to make sure that um, that would like, for example, if you break before back pain, um, that goes on the new page that then you print gastrointestinal you know, disorders and the total numbers again. So we have kind of context of the green analysis rows. We repeat them on each page if needed. And also there are in the pagination algorithm um, constraints, for example, the minimum number of siblings um, in, in the lowest analysis um, context. So for example, if you say, it needs a two, at least two siblings on both sides, then you cannot make a page break after abdominal discomfort because, um, um, because that essentially would mean those three lines above it, the content rows and the label rows would have are only for that single line and then it would be repeated on the next page. Um, but you could, for example, if the minimum number of siblings is two, you could paginate um, before back pain. Good, so that's one of the special cases with tables. Then teal, you have seen um, screenshot before, those are um, shiny web applications. We, we, we provide a framework where with relatively little effort, you can configure your modules to the particular data sets you have, and then the users of those shiny apps or teal apps um, essentially can open the app and start analysis, meaningful analysis immediately without uploading data. Um, 
And also the person who sets up the application can choose how much exploratory or how, how, how much we would like to guide the end users. Um, good. So those are some of the products. I'm going to now talk a little bit about around those products, what, what, we, what we set up and what is also very, very important when you start developing packages internal. And so documentation is probably one of the most important thing. We have very extensive documentation, which was um, meaningful, I mean, which was really important to, um, to essentially get users on board to our tools without using uh, developer time. So essentially independently onboarded tools, we also provide trainings, but um, documentation is very extensive. You see, we have different release, the release on the upper right corner, the releases are just tagged with the date when we released approximately every two months um, where we release our packages. And then we have on the top, you see the different components of our documentation. And so almost all the like user guide is a separate web page, a TLG catalog is a separate project, biomarker catalog, AP references are the package down documentation for all the packages that we release to the user and so on. Um, so there's lots of documentation um, behind those, uh, behind the overall documentation. I'm going to show a couple of them if you continue here. Um, so here is the HLR, which is a general user guide. And on the left hand side, um, it talks about turn, it talks about how you get started, how can you install it, or how can you load a pre installed release of Nest packages, then, then lots of information around Teal from. Um, very simple use to more advanced use of creating neural modules um, and some news and data access that are essentially rush specific in that case. Good. And if you go on and walk in. So in the API references, we show the package down websites where we give much more um, detail, detail on how to use the functions, the package, um, like everything with vignettes in under articles, references every function that is exported is documented with examples. Um, and so we provide that to the user um, marked up essentially because the documentation is also part of the, of the package installation itself. But with package down, you get like advantages of, for example, you see the outcome of the, when you run the um, example code. Good, if you can go to the next. The TLG catalogs um, are a product we've started to before starting Chevron, because the idea was that when we switch in the TLG space, a table list and graph space from um, SARS to R, we should first build up all the outputs that um, have been documented in SARS and um, provided as templates with R, but we didn't want to do templates at the beginning. We wanted to create those general layer, layering instructions for our table that are clinical trial data relevant. And so the TLG catalog was our, our way to essentially build output by output and then build general, general um, computational elements to get to those outputs. And so the TLG catalog shows that the code, then the output, um, all the variations and then um, if there's a teal module, it would also tell you what teal module you can use to recreate these standard outputs. Good. Um, and so that's what, what is seen by the stakeholders. Um, now by the stakeholders, which are um, statistical programmer, biostats, or anyone who would like to use our tools um, in terms of how we um, enable the developers to do efficiently their jobs and um, I mean, give some examples right now. So as Todd has mentioned, we do DevOps, um, which doesn't mean that one team does it all. We have multiple teams, but we looked at that infinite cycle of planning, coding, building, testing, releasing, deploying, um, operating, monitoring, that feeds back into the next plan. Um, so essentially being agile, looking what the users want, reassessing what we have done, and then improve it in the next um, sprint or release. Um, and then looking for feedback again, deploying it, looking for feedback. Um, that has been very good. Um, 
it adds incremental um, value to the business. Um, we get feedback. It leads to better products. Um, yeah, good. If we can go to the next, um, the teams are organized um, using as like like that part is the agility, but then the way we actually organize ourselves is using Scrum, meaning we have extensive overall backlogs. Um, backlog contains um, cards in GitHub. Those will be issues um, where it says what should be done. Every issue is an amount of work. Um, those get refined um, and um, prioritized. Then when we plan sprints, which is a gated time, like time slice, like two weeks, for example, um, where we say that one team works on, the, on some of those cards. That means we, we set a high level goal for a sprint. We move the cards that we need to um, address to, to meet that high level goal into the sprint. We looked at, we looked at the um, amount of work required for those cards doesn't exceed what the team is capable of delivering in two weeks or in the sprint period. Um, and then we keep the sprint, sprint backlog locked in the, during the sprint, meaning no other cards will be added um, um, during the sprint. Um, and so that's general, that's a very quick summary of my moment one, one step back, sorry, Kieran. Um, so that's general, like that's very, very quick how Scrum works. Um, in, then we have the daily standups. Um, we, re we release it as a retrospective um, where we say what went well, what didn't go well in the team. And we also present um, to the stakeholders and get feedback. And that we don't do like most, like the presenting to the stakeholders, we started doing more of us, more often as the product has become um, more robust and more used throughout the company. Um, we don't do it after every sprint. Um, Good, here, next slide please. Um, so those cards in GitHub are issues um, and issues then are amount of work. Once the work is done, usually they end up in changes of, in the code base, which means um, the person who works on that issue makes a pull request and says, I would like, like that's how I, that's how I um, do the work described in the issue then we require somebody to review it. So when you see on the left-hand side is a review required and we require the automatic checks to pass. And the automatic checks are, are currently run here in, um, in the GitHub um, action automation code. Um, and so those are the two requirements, checks needs to pass, somebody needs to review it. Um, and so here you see some communications and in the pull request there's communication. We automatically post communication um, via automation, but then there's also um, the reviewer and the person who makes the pull request then discuss um, um, if it's good or if changes are needed. Good, thank you, Karen. And so, yeah, so that's, that's essentially how we, we organize a very, very high level um, in the development space. Um, I do have a, three examples. Um, I can tell this one short example. Do we still have time? I think we still have time. time not. Is that time or Kieran? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah, we so um, I'm going to show one tool that we have found that we've also in house developed um, where, we, where we separate the space of package that is needed to install Nest in uh, internal and external dependencies. So all the internal ones, the one we develop, externals are what's needed to install our internal dependencies. Um, and that has been very useful um, for automation, but um, also for, for collaboration. Um, and it, 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 for, it like essentially made the importance of Docker images where everything is installed and pre-configured. Um, like it, it shifted the, the focus from those Docker images because now it's very, very easy for people to install our environment and also to make essentially an, an issue that modifies three um, repositories is po very um, possible now with stage dependencies. Um, good, so I'm going to share my R Studio session here. Um, if I um, oh, yeah, good. Good, so what you see here is um, our studio. We are in the Chevron package um, on the branch main. 
And um, so first I, I show stage dependency. Um, and the internal dependencies have this um, stage dependency YAML file. It says what's the current repository, where is it hosted? And also what are the upstream and downstream repos? So um, downstream um, that are in the internal dependencies. Downstream, we don't have at Chevron at the moment is, is the most downstream um, in that dependency tree. Of course, there are other packages that are siblings um, that may be um, more downstream packages. Good. So, and so what you can do with that, so, so we provide, we provide um, an RStudio add-in where, where you essentially can say install all the upstream packages, um, install, um, check and install the downstream package. So if you make changes, um, you can say, well, do, do my changes affect the downstream packages? Um, yeah, check and install the different versions and only test downstream pack dependencies. Um, so those are kind of the main um, features of the of stage dependency and they have have part of their origin in for example projects like basil um, yeah that that do do similar parts but it's um optimized for all packages and um fairly simple and fairly effective in my opinion so so i'm going to show you very quickly within a project instead of running this um instead of running um the R Studio add-in, I'm going to run that code here. So in the first line, I say, give me the dependency table um, for the current project. Um, otherwise I could um, specify. And what you see right now, it goes and makes a clone of all the packages. And it actually creates a dependency tree that um, includes all the, all the connected um, nodes in the graph. And then if you look at this, um, uh, Maybe I can make it a little bigger and look at this again. Um, make it even a little bit more bigger that you see the whole thing. Um, yes. So right now, um, so right now you only yeah, see nine. I'm, I'm not seeing anything at the moment. Um, I'm just oh, seeing your oh. RStudio screen. Uh, it's just, Good. Um, it's not doing uh, anything. <laughs> okay. Give me, give me a second. I, I resized it. I think um, <laughs> that um, confused them. <laughs> Good. Uh, sorry, I resized the, um, the R Studio. So when you look at this, you see 19 packages. And it, it builds iteratively the, the dependency graph. Um, and so those dependency graphs, if there's not a link to a, to a node um, from starting from Chevron, you don't see it. So there's 22 packages, but we didn't make links to all of them. So you want to see a subset. Um, that is relevant, that, that is connected from Chevron. Um, and that gets into the topic of entry points and so on. Um, you see we're currently in Chevron. Those are the upstream packages. Those are not upstream packages, but are connected on the dependency graph. Um, and so what you can do then, um, so that's some information. It works with GitLab and so on. Um, those, the GitLab packages are currently not, you can't see those. What you can do then is essentially say, well, I would like to install all the upstream packages for Chevron in the right order, which you see here, gives you the, gives you the order. I'll have that quick because I've already installed it before. It, it, it skips it if it's already installed, similar to remote install GitHub, and it shows you um, what has been installed. Um, so that works for developers that they always get the latest um, latest version of the packages, there is a cascading of branch name, meaning you get kind of that monorepo feature where you can make change multiple um, um, repositories at once um, by essentially naming convention of branch branches. What we have also added is um, without cloning the repository, you can essentially just install it somewhere with this part here, um, with this code. So essentially just point where on GitHub, what branch, um, um, and then it does it automatically. You don't need to clone that project initially. Okay, so now we have it installed. Um, and now I'm going to show you some of the examples of the R packages. So it's Chevron loads turn and R table. So I don't have to load those um, um, packages. I take synthetic data. So what you see here is not um, no sensitive patient information. It's all completely made up. Um, 
Give me a second. Oh, great. Well, I need to load that package. Uh, apologies. Uh oh. Let me click. Oh, it's of course synthetic. C display. Good. Um, apologies, yes, it's a CBA. <laughs> Sorry, this is a presentation here. Um, so we have ADSL. If you, um, it's an archive. We don't create it on, on the fly. Um, you can look at ADSL. Um, that's all made up data. We have the variable names, variable labels, um, quite a few of them. And so the first thing is very vanilla R table. Um, so we make a basic table, we split by arm, we analyze the variable age um, with mean, um, with the function mean, and what you get is a very, very simple table. Um, then in turn, we add essentially business logic with, with summaries and so on. Um, so now you can say summarize variable age um, if you build now that table. And so, and so the important piece is this is our table, this is turn here. You get a table like that. Um, and then in Chevron, we get data standard um, dependent, um, but therefore it's much less code. We also get title and footnotes if they're described in the standard documents. Um, so no footnotes here, but some titles. Good. Um, I think this is good for, for me. Todd, if you want to show, um, if there's still time, we can show. Um, yes. Below, we, can, we can continue. Yes, of course. I'm sharing the right screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, assuming you okay. want to show the tail up. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. Yeah, this is an example. So, so for, thank you, Adrian, for showing the how we how we did it how we are actually working on on those uh, different packages but i wanted to really come back to the story how we can use it right and and then first of all this example of the really ad hoc modules and where i can utilize the packages that are actually external to us like tplyr like plotly uh, like uh, like a ggplot or like a survival analysis and even here i i used the external package called, called VSR, where I added encodings, where I can switch from, from the different endpoints. Or I have actually comparing here with our internal kaplan Meier curve, which gives the same, but way uh, more in terms of encodings, in terms of, uh, yes, of course, the, 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 the endpoints, there is a faceting capability, comparison, and so on, so on. Plus, up to here, it was not shown, but I was talking about this, our code generation. So this is this is all the teal modules that we have. They have by default those uh, those capabilities. Whereas those uh, ad hoc modules, of course, you can on the top of this, you can always add and you can build your story. So this is this is actually I'm coming back to this to this uh, quote that we are challenging the status quo. How the study results are delivered because end user can use those things to to really create uh, their own uh, uh, on their own view, they can decide which of the, um, let's say, endpoints uh, user end user can can use it. What are the faceting? Which which facet here we give two of them, but we can we can give them by default all of the let's say ADSL and so on. But something that uh, maybe was not shown, uh, we can always use the filtering system, which is really intuitive. We can change from one to another. Uh, and so on. So this is this is one thing. But what I wanted to show really is the amount of code. So this is this is the R tables for instance. This is really more uh, where you need to uh, let's say uh, program a lot. Uh, we we focus more on the on this custom where we we just uh, copy and paste our 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 code and and we just rendering the the output. Whereas of course. Uh, if we use the predefined module, it's really this amount of code where I said we can really change and decide what are our variables uh, to, to navigate and really tell the story and give the end user the not all the possibilities, but really the limited possibilities uh, if, we, if we want to. 
And of course, the, the other example of ggplot, you can see really small example, this amount of code, if it's really something like a plotly, like also here, tiplier. But, but there, are, there are other examples where, where I, I, will, I, can, I can show you. I'll try to also, let me stop this one. And I will run, hopefully it works. Oh, sorry. I need to obviously run the app. This is then another example where I used our suite of different function and I was building this encodings. And you can see here is of course, looks like a very complicated thing. But in fact, we, um, to run uh, such a, a association is really defining reference and re defining var variables. So, and this we can, we can very easily do this if you want to uh, like a one row extract, we just defined what is the data set, what is the variable, what are the choices, what is the pre-selected value. And if I come back here, this is all what user need to do this and then can, can really navigate. And of course we can, we can change here and, and, and do this. And what is important, we still have this, our R code generation. So this is example uh, versus the ad hoc to the one that you can really go through this one and have a more analysis or, or, uh, co uh, or combine this with the plotly and so on. So this is how, how we can really, really uh, go and, and tell our story, not only exploratory, but also regulatory. Thank you. Uh, and I will stop sharing and come back to the presentation. I can quick share the, the remainder couple of um, um, of slides um, mm -hmm. in a second. Um, yes, so well, actually, Kieran, can you share? I think this is not the optimal. Um, oh. uh, uh, is that good enough? Or I'm not sure if we I can should present. Can you oh, that... can you not click present? I mean, I, I can. Present. Let me see that. that does that work? Do yeah, it's fine. Work. Oh, fabulous. Good. So, um, so that um, finishes the demonstration. Um, there is, we are now looking into industry collaboration. There's also collaboration, um, for example, with our studio, with our tables and teacher, and as for example, was announced at our Informa 2021. We're very happy about that. Um, and teaching, teaching here is a package to, that takes any table, like a, a, a standardized table representation, and that can come, of course, from our tables or other packages, and then it maps it, to, it, it um, maps it to different output formats like RTF, HTML, um, LaTeX, and so on. Um, so, we're very thankful for that because different pharma companies have different requirements on their rendering specifications, um, and so in the so. As Kieran has mentioned, we, we're moving towards open sourcing um, more of our package or general. At the moment, those are, um, okay, so there's also from this, those are the open source. Um, there's also Admiral and other packages that from Rush have are open source at the moment. The ones here are nest specific. Um, so, yeah. Um, and, um, maybe to wrap up the software development part and then go into the breakout session. I think there's, there's lots to say, like, I think there's lots, lots of good stuff to say which, um, about making tools that, um, that are geared towards the users and the particular use case. Um, I think there's also some, and that's what I'm focusing here, there's some um, important points when you do software development, um, you, you, you want to have that, that software maintainable, scalable, extensible. Um, and for that, you need a particular set of talents. Um, you need the tools like infrastructure and so on. Um, and it usually takes quite a bit of time to do that. Um, and so we can talk about it in the breakout room. Um, but yes, it's not um, planned today, have it in two months um, kind of exercise. Um, generally, if you don't design, your packages, then the integration will become more complex. Um, usually it leads downstream costs. Um, so say short-term saving usually 
um, end up in downstream costs um, when it's released and the end users are trying to do because there's much more end users than there are developers. Um, I think in the farmer context also, I think it's important to say that software development has generally a slower pace than other projects um, that are done to deliver the, the core business. Um, and that also needs some discussion with the different um, with leadership team and um, yeah, portfolio management. Um, and then the last thing, that shift towards the use of R, um, I think that's it it's very important to not forget that yeah, there are much more um, users than developers of the tools. Um, and some of those users, as they already deliver a lot, asking them to change technology needs a lot of support, change management um, and patient. Um, and so that I think are the kind of um, learnings or watch out um, when you um, embark such a transition. And with this, I think thank you very much for um, yeah, attending the presentation part. Maybe Kieran and Todd, do you have something to say more to this? Um, yeah, I, the, the main thing is just from the breakout session. So um, just a reminder in case anyone didn't hear this at the start, uh, to move into these breakout sessions, we're gonna have to move into a separate Zoom and this Zoom is gonna end. So um, I will, uh, or can someone put into the chat that link and the passcode? Um, and please make sure you copy and paste that um, and, and make sure you've grabbed it, make sure you have it because when the Zoom ends, you won't have that link anymore. Um, I'll give you all uh, a minute to uh, pick that up um, and then we'll, we'll end this meeting and uh, we'll, we'll start up the next, um, the, the breakout session meeting. Um, so there, there will be three different breakout sessions on these topics um, from um, myself, Adrian and Tad. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll probably just auto assign people to it. Um, but yeah, uh, just please do copy that link um, and get that passcode um, because well, I, there's basically no way for me to give it to you outside of this meeting. So if you don't get it now, it will be very difficult, basically impossible for you to join the breakout session. So yeah, just um, again, um, it's in the chat right now, or you can just type it from the screen, make sure you've got it, make sure you've got it on a notepad or, or in your browser already, make sure you've got that passcode so you're all ready for it. Um, so yeah, we'll give, uh, wait. And, and, to, and to feel, and to feel, um, to, there's a question, um, Boya and Penkov. Uh, and I think Kieran, you might be able to answer that. Um, just for context, can you talk about what you mean? Like as people copy that, <laughs> um, um, can, can you talk about what you mean by large scale? And he talks about the servers, our studio installation. How many dev um, do you support? How many users, um, more or less? Um, so it's uh, an interesting question because um, so, so directly in data sciences, it's probably around uh, a thousand users, um, but a lot of um, our platforms end up being used by wider than just our department. Um, so I'm not actually sure of the exact <laughs> number for the, for the wider user base. I know for instance, that the validated user base has about around 400 users, but the, the wider exploratory use has been used by um, people across the company actually. Um, so um, it's probably, yeah, it's, Quite a lot of people. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that it's a transition phase. Not everybody uses R. If everybody yeah. were to use R, then it's in the thousands. I would probably say, like a safe, a safe, um, a safe bet is probably like three to five thousand people would have to use the system. Is that fair to say, with contractors and all the externals and so on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we were support, like if, if everyone was doing nothing but R, then yeah, our numbers would probably go up to that. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, a question from Andy was, uh, since you started this journey, the whole industry's attitude to R has shifted significantly. Technology has moved on. What would you do differently if you started again today? I can take this question, to be honest, where how we started, we started from the exploratory analysis. And uh, I wouldn't do anything differently because over the time we learn a lot from the end users, what they want, what, what, uh, what is useful, how we can help them. 
and, and on, on an ongoing basis build those tools with, with them. And we were getting lots of feedback on the way. And uh, the same the same thing. Uh, uh, of course, today we have we built lots of uh, different uh, tools around. But but truly, we had all the principles of the careful design. This is what Adrian was saying. Yeah, think about this from the beginning on. This was our our approach. And and at the end, we 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 got where we are today. Adrian, anything to add? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a part of the tool and technology. You know, we used, we used to use Jenkins. We moved away from Jenkins. I'm very happy we did that. That really, um, 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 I think GitLab CI and um, GitHub Actions are much better, better automation tools in, te in, t in terms of transparency, what happens and so on. I think um, from an organization point, there's also the, the other questions of organization. How do you plan? How do you, uh, how do you design it? I think that's a, what's the Git workflow and so on. I think that has, that has, it's an incremental now. We develop, we change, we look, we, we look back, which we, we, we try to be, I mean, we are agile. Um, so I think, yeah, the most important thing is generally what Todd said. Don't write the piece of software and make it immediately um, a regulated GSP product before having tested it. And so exploratory to regulatory is the right journey, in my opinion, as well. Yeah. Kieran, any? Yeah, I mean, just uh, um, I, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Like, it, if you had the tooling at the start, um, would, would we have taken, particularly when we think about the platform and the setup? Um, Maybe not, but then um, definitely like the exploratory regulatory, I, I definitely agree was the right way to go because it got people more comfortable with the tools and it also gave us a chance to build a, a user base who would be prepared and uh, be ready to work in this regulatory context. Um, and in general, like a lot of this journey has been about um, us as an organization getting more and more comfortable with, with using our um, so, I, I mean, I, I think, um, are there parts of our system and architecture which we change? Um, yes, and we kind of, um, that's kind of what the, the future part is saying is like, um, if we're starting from scratch, then we'd start, we'd ideally aim for something much closer to what we have right now. Um, I mean, the other question, uh, which uh, is less of an our package question, but it's a more general environment uh, thing, which is, um, kind of we didn't get into in these slides but it's a technical debt thing which is um we have to be mindful of the uh technical debt we have in the our, our code base and our user base is our SaaS users um where, where i where i starting a company from scratch which was all our developers using r all the time um i would definitely approach some of the ways we're we're architecting and thinking about things differently because there are concerns that there are ways you approach problems in in sas that you don't really need to worry about in r and probably vice versa as well um but that's that that's still a that's still a growing thing you know like um that that r is definitely um becoming much more popular in rush but they're still um the majority uh SaaS users as well um do we have any more questions on chat uh, do, we, do we still have time or are we switching now over to the breakout let's, groups? Yeah, it might make sense to switch over to the breakout groups now. So, so one last one last reminder, um, hopefully everyone who wants to join the breakout groups has now got that link. So please do copy the link, make sure to get the passcode, that passcode 170825 and that URL. Um, and then, um, yeah, um, so do we have to end this meeting first, I think? Um, I, I can't do that, but <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> thank you, everybody. We'll see you over in the breakouts. Great, thank you.